Welcome back to Castle Rock AM. Reporting from the Attic of Needful Things, this is CM Alexander with the news. Authorities are baffled by the damage left on Poplar Street in Wentworth, Ohio. Reports of a severely localized storm destroyed this small street without damaging any other blocks nearby. Fire and rescue were called to the scene and the Red Cross is assisting with the survivors. The Ohio Red Cross is accepting donations of clothes and supplies for those affected. One volunteer told sources, It was hard to see the desperation on so many of their faces. This is Castle Rock AM. You're listening to Castle Rock AM. Welcome back to Castle Rock AM, your bi-weekly Richard Bachman Book Club podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Kahn, alongside CM Alexander. Hey, guys. And Benjamin Graham. I love books! <laughs> and we are covering the last chunk of The Regulators today, a Patreon selection from Anthony and Adarelli, with Ben leading our discussion. Ben, one last time, take it away. We rejoin the action in the Green Belt. Uh, we should recap. Right. I, yeah. Please. <laughs> Sorry, disclaimer. I have been violently sick for a month, so this book is a fever dream to me. D- it, to you. Yeah. I'll enjoy listening to you guys talk about it today. <laughs> no, I honestly, the next time I have a high-grade fever, I'm going back and rereading Hold this on. book. Wait, what if CM hasn't been sick? She's just been reading this book. <gasps> wow. Oh, it's affected if- you that violently. Tech. Oh. I mean... Oh. I mean Hey guys. <laughs> I mean, I like wolves. Uh, <laughs> You're going to die. What? <laughs> How do you recap this book? Uh, In the past 20 minutes, <laughs> yes. characters it's only from 20 minutes, television ben. You shows can't recap 20 minutes. <laughs> have appeared on Poplar Street and are blowing everything to hell. And people are going to go, <laughs> people are going to take some path through the woods to see if they can find help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> That's all we, I got. <laughs> we join our characters in the shitty woods. Like, it, are you guys imagining this? Because the green belt, it that word makes it sound like this. they're trekking like into this course. deep. Oh. I see, I, <laughs> opposite. <laughs> yeah, the opposite, like deep forest. But then I think, oh, they're in the suburbs of Ohio. It's probably yeah. like a shitty strand of trees between one identical neighborhood and the other. <laughs> is this where we get the description? Or is that in a little bit? See, can you trust yeah, the description okay. you get? Mm-hmm. So, because I, like I said, I've been six. So, like, the most recent time I've tried to make myself understand what's happening and read words, I had not grasped what this place looked like. That it, you know, it's... It's a green belt, so it's like a you know suburban foresty area, and there's a path through it. But then, as as our characters are moving along, we're getting cactus and things that look like they're drawn, and I got all of that. But then, as it goes further into the horizon, and it's like this huge landscape, and the mountains are like the jagged, like triangle yeah. charcoal drawing of a kid's mountains. I was God, like, that kicks ass. This imagery that this is painting in my head right now. And I don't know, like maybe it was because I was sick. Maybe it's because I was listening to it and then reading the words. Like really, we don't talk about that a lot. Audiobook is amazing and wonderful. But sometimes for me to absorb the story, I have to read the words with my eyes. <laughs> and this area they're in is insane to me it's wild this is the entire book every time i think of the regulators i think of this shit which is so out there yeah this is some of bachman's weirdest ideas (laughs) and the dude has weird ideas right (laughs) yeah but like the way it's yeah so evocative i can picture it exactly in my head Mm -hmm. and what does it remind me of? It reminds me of something specifically. It gives me a feeling too, but I can't identify it. Like it, it's it's like like a childhood memory almost. It's like sending me back to something. It, this isn't it, but for some reason, I just keep thinking about Monkey Bone. Oh my god, I <laughs> forgot that existed, and now I need to go back to my therapist. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, not a okay. good movie. No, it's not a good movie. But just like the cartooniness, mm-hmm. yeah, cart 
cartoonishness. Cartoonishness. <laughs> I like that you went with that instead of like who framed Roger Rabbit, which is a much more <laughs> common. Uh, but that's so that takes itself seriously in a way that I feel like that, makes it yeah, okay. more and realistic the, yeah. than this feels. Yeah, sure. and the art style oh, is yeah. like it's not cartoony in the way a Looney Tunes is cartoony. It is cartoony in everything is like very flat and unnatural. Mm. Yeah. It's Paper Mario. Yeah, but scary. <laughs> yeah, it rules. It made me wonder if they did run into that world, what would happen to them? That's a really good point. That is a, yeah, it doesn't go into that because we we soon learn we're, we start off with Entragian and Steve, yeah. yes. I believe. Yeah. We're, all of our characters are in a dozen different groups. And as much as last episode, we were praising the book for doing a great job. <laughs> it all of, falls apart here. <laughs> yeah, keeping the characters in our heads where they are. Mm-hmm. It does kind of fall apart. Which I think actually works to it's probably intentional because we're splitting up our two groups. Mm -hmm. It it works to the book's themes. It makes this like everything is wrong feeling. Everything's rushed. You're not sure what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like uh, Steve says in a later chapter, when everything goes wrong, it starts fast. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. What, if, well, because they're this is jumping ahead to something mm-hmm. they see later, but it's applicable to what we're talking about. Something Steve they they find things on the path like batteries, potato chip bag, just debris, and he watches. I think it's a baseball card later turn yeah. into a wanted poster. So that's why it, it was at that moment that I was like, okay, so if you get trapped there, you run into that world. Like, do, are you you? Do you change? Do you can you live? I see what I'm guessing. Is there oxygen there? Is there sunlight? (laughs) Can you eat? (laughs) Yes. I'm sorry. I'm really... (laughs) Well, also, but the thing is that it is also an illusion. Right. As real as everything is. I know. Are you just wandering through the normal world? Would you hit a building and not see it? I have so many questions. I don't think so. The rules are not easily right. It's not, because it it has an effect on the world. Sorry, go on, Josh. To be honest, I I think showing the illusion of endless desert is enough. (laughs) Because I I don't know that I'd want to risk the gamble on, even if I knew some was an illusion, I don't know if I would risk venturing off into the desert not knowing the reach. Because, I mean, Audrey and Seth are literally the only person in this book who have any idea what is happening at any moment. Anytime I thought I had a handle on what what is real and what is in someone's head, I changed my mind. Like, <laughs> every time I thought, oh, like this, this, these are things that are coming into the real world and are now real as well. And then something would happen. I'm like, no, I guess that's wrong. And then something mm-hmm. else would happen. I'm like, oh, no, no, that is right. And I, I still can't tell you. Yeah. And that's my, fine. My I like theory... It. I would love first. Uh, sorry, Josh. Oh, I, I just want to say I would love to hand this book to someone, whether they've read King or Bachman. Who's King? Uh, <laughs> what's our fiction uh, again? Uh, Inconsistent. Yeah, who's <laughs> never read Bachman or has? Just give them this book and go. Okay, read the first chapter. What's the next chapter going to be about? <laughs> <laughs> be fun. Because <laughs> it would be an impossible game oh, to play. For sure. So my theory is that, as we find out also later, that every person who dies, Tack is becoming stronger. Mm-hmm. That if he were to achieve the full power and get all of uh, Seth's shine, he would be able to make this fiction reality. Yeah, that makes sense. And so right now, all so of this you is could tenuously. Be in there and then it'd yeah. be real. Like, if they'd ventured off into the desert and Tack had still somehow won, then yeah, then you'd just be trapped in Cartoon World Desert. That's my guess anyway. Huh. I just I want to talk about what they see at the end of this path. Yes. Which is one of those cartoon cactuses with a a, a, a bum. Attached w- to it. Attached <laughs> to it. Yeah, he's leaning back against it, smiling, and it's, his eyes are like popped out of his head. And I don't remember this character being referenced ever before it, this, correct? He wasn't. Okay, nope. because later on, they refer to him as mm-hmm. though we should know who he was. Okay. It's really one of those moments that you're like, oh, he was really making this up. <laughs> and you can tell his writing style is the, the stuff that happens later didn't exist until he wrote sure. it. So. Or, oh, sorry. Well, oh, yeah. We'll get to it, but 
that guy's there to meet Peter. Right. Which yes. still doesn't make any, <laughs> never makes sense. So this is what we get later, like, where it's all over the place and we haven't even passed like three pages into this <laughs> section. But when they talk about the, the homeless man later, it's implied that the way it's written implies to me that in a earlier draft of this, there was a sequence written and because it didn't move anything forward in a way that mattered, it was cut. Hmm. That's the way it reads to me. Yeah. Hmm. Because it sounds like this person is like the sacrificial catalyst that gave him this final power to start the attack. Yeah. It, that seems like the patient zero because of the eye bulging and grinning hmm. face and all that. Is this our first deleted scene in a book that we've yeah. talked about? <laughs> No, the long walk. <laughs> yes, the long walk. The, the had secondary. It, uh, the, oh, pl- I'm sorry. Excuse <laughs> me. The true ending of the long walk. And if you listening don't know what we're talking about, you've got to listen to those episodes. I, at first, when I, I they're describing this corpse, first of all, being impaled on the cactus mm. is really upsetting to me because <laughs> it. It is so incongruous with the way it looks in my head to have a human being speared by this weird cell shaded cactus. Mm -hmm. It's just creepy. But the face, the eyes exploding, awful. Hate it. Mm -hmm. 10 out of 10. (laughs) Terrible. But the big Joker grin. Yeah. Yep. Oh, no. That's, it's the worst. I can't not think of the Joker. I know, of course you, not. It probably yeah. made you laugh, and it horrified me and Josh. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds on brand. Yeah. No, I was just like, I, oh. But the it, big Joker grins are terrible. Like, the, those are scary. Like, in the, you know. It didn't get me <laughs> until the end. Okay. When we get uh, the, the letter from the miner. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That was the point where I was like, oh, that is very scary. I don't like that. When a grin is an impossible size, Mm -hmm. it will always be the most unnerving thing. And Audrey um, talks about something happening and she's not in control of herself. And there's like this energy around her that feels awful. And she feels like grinning. And Mm -hmm. so all of those things, I think, combined makes that moment. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Funny to Ben. (laughs) Black Hole Sun music video. Yep. It's, oh my gosh! Yeah, that's <laughs> <it's laughs> all I can think of, and that makes me chuckle. You've you've really like neutered the terror of that <laughs> scene for me now. <laughs> Good. We're about to cut back to the houses, but first, football-sized green eyes <gasps> open in the distance. The the creatures. The first thing I want to say is all the Buick Eight energy, right, guys? You know, for you're right, but for some reason I wasn't thinking of that because of the kids drawing aspect. Sure. So, but yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. Yeah. That's a good connection. The coyote with human fingers bothers me. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Oh, I just I don't like it. Wow, I you're just don't real high maintenance. <laughs> like it. We meet up with Peter standing this, oh, on his back porch. That's so sad. It is sad that Peter and Mary in this book just like in for these authors just can't get a break (laughs) it's he's i i got lost in this for a moment like i didn't know if this was a flashback for him because he was was talking about him looking at his stack of you know articles and things and he's working on something that he thinks is gonna like wow everybody Mm. and then i think we hear the howling of the coyotes and he's like oh i gotta go meet my friend now and just like bumps past the table and all of this hard work just falls to the floor like unnoticed by him and for some reason that got me like that's who peter is Uh and Mm -hmm. that just showed me in that moment he is gone it's a great piece of writing and a great piece of acting in the audiobook frank mueller yeah uh love him or hate him love him personally but the one line Peter gets is delivered in such a weird way. Best get to crawling. And it's so (laughs) creepy. All right, I'll go listen. It's great. So as he wanders off into the green belt, 
to surely ambush and kill our remaining characters. I was right? certain. Right? I was certain. It is such a setup, like a, such a classic setup of the character that gets turned by the bad guy and used as a weapon <sighs> against mm-hmm. our heroes. And it's so nothing that happens with him mm-hmm. that I kept thinking that I missed it. <laughs> I loved it. We should get to the yeah. other parts because uh, we are back with Audrey in her uh, her special dream world. Mohonk. Mohonk? Mo- yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, it is right. That sounded no, so it's, wrong. I lo- it's a very dumb name for a place. <laughs> I do like that we've talked about in the past episodes this being her, her laughing place, her mm-hmm. safe place, and all this safety she found there. And I like that it's here that we start getting her being annoyed. Cracks in the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Realizing you can't live forever this way in this place. Yeah. It seems like as things are escalating, Seth might be losing power too to keep up the illusion. Oh, that's true. I hadn't thought about that. Oh, God. I didn't even think about also. So we know that, you know, Seth helped her make this place. But Mm -hmm. when she imagines the phone, I wonder if Seth already knew about she thought she imagined it but seth already knew to put it there basically Mm, that could be i think this is like two parts i'm thinking of here maybe but where audrey starts to get annoyed with things like she's not content being in here and and it's clear something is going to have to change like Mm -hmm. we're we're coming up on this moment i think it, it might not be in this sequence but maybe a little later she's like she's annoyed with jan she's uh hates all of the like moto cop and cassie styles thing and I don't know why this makes me think of it in this spot, but she has she had made the comment at some point that she hates Cassie Styles so much she wishes that No Face or Meatwad or whatever (laughs) (laughs) would like strangle her to death and would just kill her Mm -hmm. and she would be done with her, which struck me because she has been made to look like Cassie Styles, and I keep Mm. I just want to put this out there for you guys, the end of the book with her. I keep thinking about her thinking that about Cassie Styles and Seth being in her mind and her being mm. like Cassie Styles. I don't know if I'm making too much of it or if that's a thing, but it seemed almost like a, a desire that was fulfilled mm-hmm. by of. a child at in the, a childlike way. At the very least, it does add an interesting context yeah. to the ending that – this is kind of because I, I didn't catch that, mm-hmm. but it is kind of a a hint at a, her yeah. her views on continuing in this reality that Tack has created. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's been living in hell for years, two years. Yeah, has lost everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway, that's super dark. Let's let's just go away from that for a moment. Yeah, let's go to all of the happy stuff that happens in the last (laughs) third of the book. Like the tack phone ringing. Yes! I was so scared at first because earlier she's like, when the tack phone rings, Mm -hmm. it means he found me. But it's not. That's not what it means. It's Seth. And Seth gives her a mission and says, now's the time to get the fuck out, so make a break for it. Uh, A mission that she says is so simple that she can't believe she didn't think of it before. I love this because before they revealed what it was, like a reasonable amount enough that I feel proud of myself for thinking of it. I was like, why doesn't she just do that? Which we'll save for when we get Mm -hmm. there. But I thought of that first. And then when they did it, I was like, amazing. Good, they're doing it. I completely blindsided, had no idea. There are a couple of things that are... The culmination of the book, the way that they defeat Tack, mm-hmm. are set up so early in the book mm-hmm. and in such a throwaway manner <laughs> that when it comes back, you're like, that's the solution? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Crazy. This book is crazy, it y'all. This book is madness. Is. I, the main characters are... A Power Rangers knockoff. Like, <laughs> it's nuts. No, not even Power Rangers. It's like Mask, right? Oh, yeah. Anyway, it's... I forgot about Mask. Insane. He gives her this mission, and she exits her uh, her dream world. We meet up with John and the twins, who mm-hmm. are following, unknowingly, 
<laughs> Steve and Collie into the woods. I didn't expect the shenanigans. Like, if you, because it's broken up with other scenes, but if you look at this scene in a whole, the way it plays out is almost slapstick, like with deadly oh, sure, consequences. Yeah. But thinking about it all sequentially is like, wow. <laughs> What'd you think of all the Johnny backstory? Finding out this Johnny's also a piece of shit. <gasps> yes. He's better than the other Johnny. Like I know. I, I, so I liked and I hated a few things because we, Johnny's reflecting on when he first moved to this neighborhood mm-hmm. and his editor or whoever's in charge, his agent, yeah. hated it. And he's like, what are you doing? You didn't understand. And so he's telling us how he came to be here. And it's, again, because of Terry, he was having a conversation with her and she's like, you need to get away from like everything you know, including yourself. Like you need to just go back, go back somewhere you've never been. And unlike our other version of Johnny, you know, he still keeps the impact of her words from her because he doesn't want her to know what an effect she has on him. But it's not like super prideful and weird the way it was before. Mm -hmm. And he splits the proceeds with her. Yeah. And I I, I really love that. I didn't love when he's like, oh yeah, my ex-wife who I once tried to stab with a fork. A butter knife. Or show some respect. Oh sorry. (laughs) I I he while he tried to fork her, I thought that was a little Ah. more intimate. So he (laughs) but what I liked was the AA part, because I always love that stuff. Because at first he's like, what you're talking about is a geographic cure. And that doesn't work for alcoholics. She's like, it's not related to your disease. It's your brain just needs a reset for your writing. Because he was, I wish we could have explored this more, but we did not have time Mm -hmm. in this book. He was having a problem where he couldn't reconcile his new sober life and his career. Because every, every time he would try to write, it was a reminder because he spent his writing life you know, drunk or on drugs. And so it was like this, these triggers, but yet this is the thing that he's meant to do. So she helped him resolve that. And it was really cool. And that's where the detective kitty cat novels came in. It was just a throwaway story he made up to shut up his nephew yeah. when he was being a brat one day. I I read through this section and even more than Steve's backstory earlier, during this section, I kept, my knee-jerk reaction was to look for the turning point what happened in this version of the universe that made everyone be in ohio instead of i was looking for that for the entire book which is stupid because it's not the point of the book it's, it's not, super not one. <laughs> yeah it's not an alternate reality it's just oh the, i have well a, yeah. but you know what i mean it's yeah. yeah i kept yeah i'm glad you said that because i kept catching myself going wait they were in desperation. Was that before or after the mine collapsed? Like, when yeah. does this take place in the timeline of desperation? Yeah, it's and weird. I was like, I, the thing that made me think of it is like, oh, this couldn't have been. There's nothing that could have happened in this world in the last that would make uh, David and Pi be a married right. older couple. Right. And like, and that was like the first bit of information we got. Yet we're still, yeah, idiots. still looking for connections. The uh, curse of all uh bachman readers we are (laughs) truly eternal book nerds like that is the definition of an eternal Mm, book nerd absolutely in the present oh right mariel dies i swear (laughs) that already happened i swear that already happened this was my one moment of sympathy for gary because she dies it's horrible we don't talk about it's just you know so dying is hard and he's drunk and he comes in and he's, you know, he's been just like slurring and being an idiot. And so you think he's going to continue to be an idiot. And once he realizes that she's dead, they cover her, Cynthia and Tom. He takes her hand from underneath the cover and he holds it yeah. and just starts crying. Doesn't say anything, doesn't cause a scene, just is grieving. And in that moment, because I, I hated them a lot, like the first episode we recorded, mm-hmm. I don't anymore. I'm just like, fuck, I'm sorry, guys. It's such just a human moment. Very human. That you go, oh. What a nice way to humanize a character that has been cruelly written to be dislikable for things that are complicated. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And not like fucking Cammy and Kim or whatever their names are. Oh, yeah. I could not keep them straight (laughs) the entire fucking book. Isn't one of them dead? All right. No, that's Pi. Pi's dead. Yeah. 
Okay. <laughs> uh, and before we head back out to the green belt to see what the growling and gunshots were about, everyone takes a look out at the front yard. No. <laughs> and uh, now everyone's starting to see the changes that uh, Steve and Cynthia and Tom saw last episode. And the uh, the easy stop is a saloon now. So this is becoming a sort of a mishmash of the regulators movie that Seth likes and Moto Cops and and the Ponderosa Pon- from Bonanza. 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 Okay. Yeah. So it's like a things don't quite match yeah. the things that they're seeing. It's really weird. The one thing about this, like this, it, it isn't until later on, but it's very weird that now that I know that the regulators is a made up movie that doesn't really exist. It's very weird when in the final showdown, a bunch of very real people show up. <laughs> like the <laughs> fact that the final assault is the moto cop car- cartoon characters, but also the guy that played the rifleman. Like that's a mm. real dude. Yeah. And he yeah. is one of the final villains of this <laughs> book. Weird in the green belt. Oh, this I was we were ready for the death of one of the twins. Yeah, this yeah. okay, this like is, it's so obvious. This part isn't obvious. This these sections in the green belt are difficult to keep track of. I just figured mm. out why. Because we get the scene play out to a certain point, and then we jump to the perspective of another character, but we go back a step, mm-hmm. so we're not picking up with them where the scene stopped with the other one. So it kept throwing me off because I'm like, wait, aren't they upset about this thing that just happened? <laughs> but we're we're getting like we're backtracking. We just see it yeah. from both perspectives because Steve and, and Trajan, Steve and Kali, and I love Kali, and I was so mm-hmm. happy that he survived because I feel Same. like he needed a win. They encounter, I guess it's a creature, a, a nightmare child's monster. I can't even describe it. Uh, the uh, I think it says like something about orange, tri- like the triangle teeth you draw inside, mm-hmm. but they're like this gross orange, and it's chasing it's Steve huge. and Kali, and they are making a break for it when suddenly a shot rings out and uh, the top of Kali's head sh- flies off. Yeah, Whoa. as they are running back to the house, they run into the twins and Johnny, and. Johnny, of course, sees all of this with his perfect time mm-hmm. vision and sees, uh, which it's Jim, yes. who has yeah. the gun. And Dave yells, shoot him, shoot him, and shoots. And it doesn't even tell us which one. It is nope. it, these two run out of the woods, and he shoots the one on the left, uh, taking off the top of his head. And the other and, one puts his hands up. Uh, this, so, I was so angry in this sequence because we that happens and then we go to is it johnny's perspective yeah. next mm-hmm. where everything's calm and they're walking and they're hearing these growls and stuff so the twins are on edge but they had been the way he describes they had been making their painstakingly slow way through because they didn't want to like disturb a single branch so you that tells us even if we don't realize it how wound up and on edge they are yeah. and i i loved because i also have this thought that he thinks later why didn't I take the gun away as soon as we got in? Like, they're I'm children. I'm so glad he yes, beats himself up about it. because I would have been furious. Mm-hmm. But he watches Jim shoot, who we find out is Kali, and Jim doesn't know, doesn't know what he's done. He's still, like, just so freaked out that he thinks he's shooting bad guys. Mm-hmm. And Dave is screaming for him to shoot him. He doesn't know either. I was really upset with these two boys but later we kind of get a sense that Tack may have been influencing more than just the final thing that Jim yeah. does. It made a little more sense that they were so like, obviously they're heightened, but when they just couldn't let go of things or react reasonably or get their shit together. And I was getting frustrated mm-hmm. later on. I'm like, Oh yeah. And before they have a chance to resolve any of this, a fucking monster jumps out and almost kills Steve like the bathroom oh, scene. It's a mountain in lion. Desperation. Yeah. Yeah. I oh, forgot, shit, we, yeah. We, we didn't, he, oh, yeah, yeah. We didn't finish describing it's, it. It's described as mostly a, what a mountain lion would look like if a child drew it, but monstrous. Mm-hmm. And it, it was just, it's like a a mirror of yeah. what happened to Steve in Desperation, mm-hmm. which I think is fun. He's, it's on him, but he's got his arms up blocking his neck. 
Mm-hmm. So and he's, he's holding he's holding the rifle yeah. between him and the mm-hmm. mountain lion. <laughs> and then we c- cut away again to Audrey's diary two nights after uh, her and Herb f- saw the dream cruiser parked in front of their house. I did not realize that this missing dream floater was going to be so crucial to what happens. And yeah. I'm horrified that it's as crucial as it is. Yeah, she all of the the stuff in her diary sucks. Mm-hmm. It is nightmarish. It is the worst part of the book in my opinion. This like being trapped and having absolutely no no way to do it's I love the Twilight Zone episode. Uh it's a wonderful life. Mm-hmm. It's such a fucking scary episode of television. With the little kid with that wishes people out into the cornfield. It's hmm. horrifying thinking of the id of a small child with infinite power. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Audrey has been marking the the differences between Seth and Tack and can mostly tell when which one is which. We spend a lot of time with her. Not having identified tack yet, or, or knowing it's tack, just knowing it's something different. And where she refers to Seth, at, part of Seth as the stocky little boy, SLB. And that, I I had a little trouble with Audrey's diary because, la- I think it was last episode I was saying it, sh- she has some uncharitable mm-hmm. thoughts towards Seth when it's not his fault. He's just mm-hmm. as much of a, of a victim, possibly in ways more because it's his head even than she in her bar. And as you, as we go through her diary, you see that she knows this isn't Seth. And it's just, I think it's just the writing was a little bit incongruous. I don't know that it was intentional, but. So what I think two things that clicked into place for me about this diary entry, one was that what I think is happening with those uh, incongruous remarks are early on, she's still kind of fresh enough to see it. But where we've met her now, when she has some of those, I don't like those uncharitable thoughts. It's been at the end she's of this just two worn years. Down. That yeah. makes sense. And I wonder if these chapter, like these sections are to let us know that like, oh, this is how far she's lost it a little bit. Like this is. I think it was, it's just the timeline of it. Yeah. Because for, yeah. The timeline's hard to. Yeah, because for me, I'm hearing her have these thoughts, you know, earlier on, and then yeah. now we're backtracking, mm-hmm. and it gets a little muddy. But that makes a lot of yeah. sense. I I would agree with that. And the other thing was the the stalking little boy. We talked a lot about how he moves and stuff. And I sent this in the group chat when I figured it out. He's Tack is moving Seth like you'd move an action figure. He mm. moves him. He doesn't move his joints. Or when he makes him float. He, oh, like he, like a kid with like, like a kid wielding. I think when he's an the stocky figure. little boy, he hasn't reached the point of floating yet. No, he hasn't. So he's walking. Oh, right, but right. That's like but a it's progression. Tack, of, it's yeah. like how you would move a toi if you were had a GI sure. Joe and were walking him. That's how figure. he walks him. Yeah. Okay, I get that. Yeah. But also, still, that's just a thing autistic no, people I, do. <laughs> so sure, I feel like I feel like the extreme. It, because she, Audrey describes it, the action is very extreme, and that's mm-hmm. why I feel like that's how I would how I used to walk my action figures. Mm-hmm. So it just clicked. Oh, mine were like side to side like this. Yeah. So uh, was, unless he was like a bobbing little boy, I wouldn't have. <laughs> I would, yeah. <laughs> One thing before we move through her diary, uh, she also describes the atmosphere that Tack produces, which is extremely extremely frightening Mm -hmm. uh she describes it as (laughs) there's this point where (laughs) she is writing in her diary right and there's a point where she starts to describe the feeling that he puts out and she says oh diary if only i were a better writer and i could describe it good and i'm like (laughs) good out bachman (laughs) You don't have to write good if you write, but it is written. It it goes on to be very well written. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay. Do you guys want me to talk about the gross part? Yes. Uh, All of the gross, there's many gross parts. I feel like you might be more comfortable if I say (laughs) it and everyone listening might be too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Audrey, you, you said she's talking about this like feeling in the air, this 
like pressure and uh, almost electricity it's kind of described as and it's so powerful that it is nearly painful and this i want to mention this it's gross but i just want to mention this because it's it gives such a clear insight into the horror that her and her husband and seth have been living together in for years and she goes on to describe how it gives you a horrible headache and sometimes the pressure is just so strong that the only way to relieve it is she'll go into the bathroom and she'll lock the door and she will masturbate like furiously and the orgasms that she has are nearly violent like it's not good they're terrifying uh-huh. and it it's it's just such a like such a personal and visceral thing to talk about and she's telling us this in her diary but it makes me feel like as i'm reading it i like tack have violated her in a yeah. weird way oh. it kind of like puts you in this weird position and, and i think it's to like sympathize with her more and understand mm-hmm. how hard this has been at least that's the effect it had on me it, it also ties into the weird sexual aspects of the fetishes from desperation yeah. absolutely the yeah. feeling that steve and cynthia had when they touched the totem mm-hmm. yeah there's more i won't be ex- as explicit with this mm. one because it's about a little boy so i don't want to but she um s- observed some behaviors some sexual behaviors in seth with the cassie styles doll which is who she's being forced to model herself after that are um just so fucking like we're talking a scene scenes from the exorcist level mm-hmm. of graphically upsetting Yes. stuff there so that's if you're if you're listening and you haven't read it that's the kind of shit we're dealing with in this diary it doesn't shy away from the darkness not at all did i miss anything <laughs> no we get a lot of diary uh in this it's section long. it goes through uh do we know the the length of time it's i think like six months overall because they, yeah, they do she, jump like a month here yeah. And then it jumps a few weeks and then another month. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, the next important bit is finding out what happened to the Hobarts. And Uh, Dream Floater. Yeah, (laughs) and Dream Floater. One day. The uh, most important part of that, apparently. (laughs) Audrey answers the door while Seth is taking a nap. And it is the neighbors from across the street, the Hobarts. Uh, the father, who is this large, very scary man, mm-hmm. and his little shitty son, who is holding the dream floater. And has a bruise on his cheek or eye. Yeah. But Audrey immediately knows his dad gave to him. Mm-hmm. It's This book has a weird thing where all of, most of the people, there are a number of people in this book that terrible things happen to. And Bachman goes out of his way to show you why they were really shitty people. Did you ever feel like he was trying to make excuses for, like, these people kind of deserved getting this? Because Shani says later on that, like, after he finally makes the connection that Seth is doing this, he says he had to ask himself if the people of Poplar Street brought this on themselves, if we didn't deserve this because she's been going through this hell and none of us noticed or It's when he walks into the house and he sees the state of the house. The way she's been living. Which we've we've seen it through her eyes, so we don't know the degree of it, but once we see it through Johnny's eyes, like it's full-blown described as like a, like it's not been cleaned, Mm -hmm. it's people are just surviving, it smells terrible. And that did strike me like he's I didn't see it that way. I just was like, oh, he he feels, you know, so guilty because they've, you know, all these Mm -hmm. neighbors have sort of like abandoned this woman, not intentionally. But Mm -hmm. you what you said did make me think about how I I kept feeling like we sort of talked about this the first episode. This is more king than desperation. I feel like these books are flipped. I I feel like desperation was crueler to its characters and i feel like there's like a little more attempt at heart in here for them like i guess i saw the the additional descriptions as an attempt for us to understand well yeah that person you thought was shitty you know they're just a person and life is complicated see there are two things that jump out at me about that 
One is that I had anticipated a reveal of this being a sort of revenge story that somehow Seth was mistreated and, Mm -hmm. you know, like, but in like the neighborhoods to blame and the, is using the, the evil power. That's how the power influenced him to attack. Like, I assume maybe the kids beat him up and that's why Carrie Ripperton was the first one who was killed. Mm. That's where I started going down. Interesting. What the Hobart story and the the Sodderson couple have very much in common for me that Bachman has a great way of doing, which I, he, we saw him do it in Thinner as well, of saying, uh, meeting somebody who's fucking terrible and you're like, God, I hope they die. And then something bad happens to him and you're like, yeah. And then it gets worse and you're like, oh, and then it gets worse. And you're like, I... I didn't want him to suffer that bad. So I just, now you're I the bad. To, you're the bad guy. Right. The Bachman you you kind of got what you wanted. Yeah. But man, like the way, like the the Suttersons and the way the Hobart family, like what happens to them, like <laughs> no matter how bad they are, it's torture. Maybe this is more Bachman. Okay, I don't know. I'm coming yeah. around. <laughs> but how about uh, Cammy? They go out of their way to be like this person that up till that point was just a kind of a nothing character. And then in the last two chapters, it's like, oh, what the hell? Where is this? This book has not been about this up (laughs) until now. (laughs) So maybe uh, I don't know. I just have the feeling that like what what's the takeaway here in this book I don't think there is one I don't in this think book. We get I really don't away. think so. I I don't feel like I often find a takeaway in Bachman books. That's true. Yeah. I just feel gross. <laughs> <laughs> I, can I just like quickly say what happened with the Soddersons? Yes. Yeah. We find out that the little boy swiped Dream Floater. And so or dad, Hobart's not Soddersons. Or sorry, yeah, Hobart's. So dad brings him over and he's like clearly has already punished him and now he's he's making this righteous attempt you know it's very clear that this is like a religious thing that we are going to be grossed out by this is for more for them than it is for audrey and seth yeah basically he's he wants to show that his family is righteous essentially Mm. so he's you can tell this kid like has been coached on exactly what to say and he's just spitting it out like a robot and so he stole it and you know they want to apologize and the whole time, Audrey's just freaked out because she's like, if Seth wakes up and Tack, fi- Tack, sorry, I'm saying talk because they say talk. In the I hate it. <laughs> yeah. And Tack figures out what happened. This is going to be bad. So she's trying to get rid of them. And this guy, I love, like, he's being really pushy and he tries to come into the house. And she, like, pushes him back and is like, you know what? Like, stop. This is it. I All I need from your kid is for him to say, I stole this. I was wrong. And I'm sorry. And because she took control of the situation and it wasn't the dad, like all of a sudden now he's upset about the apology, which was just in just a fun moment. It's like, oh, you fucker. (laughs) And so that happens. And then over the course of the next couple of weeks, I think it is the Hobarts keep experiencing violence to their home and then their pets and then themselves. They're, his car tires are slashed and windows broken out um, one night. And, and he confronts her. He thinks, like, they're getting revenge on them. She's like, I'm not a vengeful person. Like, I didn't. And she seems so surprised. Like, he believes her. It's yeah. genuine. And But she's thinking, okay, so, like, what's Seth's reach? This is to illustrate Seth's power and reach and how it's growing. And the another thing that happens, somebody, <laughs> somebody throws rocks in their windows and shatter, the windows of their home shatters mm-hmm. their windows She's like, I bet there are no rocks in there. If you go look, their cat is killed. The mother gets, with a, the, nosebleed. gets a horrible, like has to go to the hospital nosebleed. And the dad falls down the stairs. And when we find out later, I think it's from when Audrey's telling everybody, you know, about what's been going on. She talks about how Tack made her fall down the stairs. So it like puts that into a different light too. Yeah. It's the until uh, they move away, and Seth tells her they have to move because she's like, "Stop it!" And he's like, "I can't. They have to leave." When she makes the connection that it was leaving the father alone so he could watch, I was Ooh, like, brutal. "Holy fuck!" Tack is throwing a tantrum. Yeah. Do you think it's because he's in the body of a kid who I think throws, so. you know, kids throw tantrums? Like, does that influence? Does that shape in some way his? That's interesting. Powers. 
Yeah. Because all, like, do you think Tack came out of the hole being like, you know, I think I'm going to like, like, moto cop shit now. <laughs> That's my jam. <laughs> uh, how about this for fucked up? The uh, Hobart's move on July 8th. And it there's an entry of uh, oh, her yeah. celebrating that yeah. oh thank God they're they're moving they will they will survive they'll get away, and the next entry is eight days later and it's Herb having killed himself and nothing says that it's just her mm-hmm. swearing like grief swearing at tack just. Like how how am I going to go on? You know, you bastard. Yeah, because she, she surmised sad. that Tack had been basically draining and feeding off of her, mm-hmm. but to do what it was mm-hmm. doing to the Hobart. He didn't have a place to go, like mm-hmm. Seth, and maybe Seth could only make that place for her, or maybe he could only make one place. But yeah, he he just drained him dry until he that was it. And we got mm-hmm. in the diary, we got a lot more stuff with her and her. And it's just, you I, like him. I yeah. liked him. It, it's heart-wrenching, and we don't get another journal entry for three months. Our final journal entry, Audrey gets a letter from a guy that lives in desperation who showed the Garens around the mines, and she knows that he is lying. Because wasn't that, that was the letter that she references earlier that said, mm-hmm. oh yeah, they came by, but they didn't, mm-hmm. yeah. we couldn't take mm-hmm. him anywhere. Didn't believe yeah. it. God, it jumps around so that much. That was so much. The end of our first chapter. (laughs) Jesus. 53 minutes. (laughs) At the start of chapter 10, Johnny kills the mountain lion exactly like he did in Desperation. Rad. Uh, (laughs) It bleeds pink insulation. Yes. I thought that was cool. I didn't expect that. It Uh, bleeds the puffy pink insulation and it dissolves in the white smoky stuff. Uh, That's why you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. That it describes that pink the, how it puffs mm-hmm. up out of it the same way. And mm-hmm. It's great. <laughs> okay, so after he shoots this creature, I was so, this is where I got really angry and ticked off. Dave blames Johnny, mm. but yes, Johnny should have taken the gun. But what he does is he just starts saying, you killed him. And he keeps saying that when other people are there, including his mom. That shit's so crazy. It, that's one of those moments of writing that I'm just like, oh, I hate you for doing that because now I'm like so anxious and wound up about it. But he and Johnny like grapple. He is attacking him and has him on the ground and he's trying to choke him. And Steve, man, I haven't changed my opinion on him. Anytime he tries Mm -hmm. to do something, he fucks it up. (laughs) He tries to help Johnny and just throws him off balance. And that gives (laughs) Dave the upper hand. (laughs) God, I referenced it last episode. I really love the uh, the monsters of what it fuck. It's my second Twilight Zone reference this episode. Uh, the monsters have arrived on Maple Street, I believe it's called. Oh, I don't know if I've seen no. that one. It is an amazing episode. It's uh, kind of a satire of Cold War feelings. It is a suburb, you know, mm-hmm. a real leave it to beaver. Everyone, just nice families living in their nice houses. But one night, I believe... This is, I haven't seen this in a few years, so I I don't know how accurate any of this is, but it's something like the lights all go out on this street, and they all, all the neighbors convene to figure out what's going on, and sometimes the light will come on at one house and go on, and they all, throughout, as the episode goes on, start blaming each other that, Mm. oh, well, isn't it weird that this happened, and All of these, like, underlying frustrations and underlying, like, shitty attitudes start coming out and they they distrust each other. Uh, In the end, it turns out it's aliens uh, testing Mm. humanity's willingness to uh, trust each other. (laughs) (laughs) Um, We always fail that one. But I I love this. I I wish there was more of this, like, the two houses or the the factions. That could have been an entirely different story all its own. For sure. like, mm-hmm. Well, and I, I kind of breezed over it. And by breezed over, I mean, didn't mention it at all. Sorry. Doing the best I can. Mm-hmm. Dave is so upset because we find out later this is tax influence mm-hmm. helping things along. But Jim blows his own head off once he realizes because they're like, stop, that's Kali. You just killed Kali. And once he kind of figures that out, tax just leaps onto that grief and shame and guilt 
and he shoots himself. Yeah, we are not told. That. Yeah, I love that we don't know that right away. Because what we just see is that all of the the survivors mm-hmm. kind of gathered around Kali and then Steve or whoever turning around going, no. no. Yeah, and then we're jumping to other people. It's That's why I didn't say anything because mm-hmm. it's so hard to keep <laughs> track of, you guys. Uh, but that is when, of course, the, the amazing timing of all of this cami comes out of the woods and this is the part this is the thing about the jumping back and forth i like how it like slowly reveals what's happening mm-hmm. but every time a new character runs out of the woods i'm like who is this now <laughs> i couldn't yeah. keep track of who was there and in what order because we were going to jump back in time again so that cynthia can mm-hmm. join the party yeah. so we keep like taking steps back I do like you don't get the scene with how Cammy and Brad joined this. Right. But I do love that it's very obvious from everything we know about Brad that Cammy decided she had to go off after her kids after hearing a gunshot and Brad wasn't gonna fall? let her go yep. alone. Mm-hmm. And for the record, Brad's amazing. Reading it this way is fine. Having a discussion about it this way is, cha- <laughs> is a challenge. It's gently yeah, challenging. So that's it's fine to read. It's just hard to talk about coherently. <laughs> So now we have out on the path, Cynthia, Cammy, Brad have just joined Steve, Johnny, and David, uh, who are living. <laughs> and yeah, and Kali is now dead, but before he died, he made a not confession. And I was but, right. Yes, he you were right. He is hold, like trying to grab Dave's hand and he's like, my hands are clean. I, you know, as he's dying, he's like trying to choke this out. It's very upsetting. He's like, it, and it was a setup. Yeah. It's such, it's a, such I a know. sad moment of like, this is obviously a huge part of his life yeah. and we get no resolution. No. And David's a kid and he's just like, Hey man, try not to talk. You shouldn't be talking. And then he can't pull himself away until he hears Johnny scream. No, or Steve scream. No. Yeah. And he turns and it's, Jim shooting himself and then he just leaves. So Kali presumably like just dies trying to let somebody know he's innocent and then that person just takes off. But spoiler alert, Dave survives. So Kali That's maybe true. down the line will get, you know vindicated. Yeah. yeah. As Cammy shows up, Cammy showed up by now, right? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She shows up and sees Dave attacking Johnny, screaming, you killed him. So she sees the fallen gun at the same time as Cynthia, and they both rush for it. There's a fight. Cammy gets the gun. She points it at Johnny, and then Peter shows up. And you go, (laughs) oh, fuck. It's all going down. Here it comes. (laughs) He's going to be explode with demon power. (laughs) And it's going to be chaos. And he walks past them. With a smile on his face. Yeah. And and that's that everyone looks at him and is like, oh, my God, what happened? Because his eyes are blown out of his head and he's covered in blood. And he goes to talk to his friend, the uh, homeless man impaled on the cactus. Who is dead, by the way. He can't. (laughs) We later get the hint that, like, Tack sucked all the energy out of this hobo. Why'd he send Peter to go talk to him? It's, that's just how Tack. This look on his face. It's just how Tack gets rid of his garbage. Yeah. It's oh, he used gross. them up and then he goes, I don't need you anymore. Go kill yourself. <gasps> and he drew, like he draws strength from their pain. Imagine the pain of slowly dying as your lungs collapse because you leaned too hard against a cactus. And Which he thankfully doesn't lungs. feel. Yeah, he doesn't feel any of it. It just, he leans against a cactus, impales himself in several places, and dies. Okay, I'm going to have to reread this when I'm not sick, because I, <laughs> I could not, I'm like, did he forget to write why Peter had to go out there? Like, what's wrong? I mean, and he's, we know he has, Tech has to kill everyone, mm-hmm. so... What better way of just sending Peter to go take care of himself? I guess it threw me because it seemed like it was an accidental saving of Johnny. It definitely was. So then I I was expecting more with Peter. I was expecting. It seemed like he was the savior in that moment. For sure. Which I guess good for Peter. (laughs) Peter to attack. 
and yeah. for Cammy to unload the gun into him. Yeah, I him. thought that as she fired, like yeah. he was stepping in and the, he was going to take the bullet inadvertently yeah. for Johnny. Yeah. Yeah, instead he just yells at his mom and says, you killed him too. Why did you let us come mm-hmm. out here? Fair question. Good points all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, what do you guys think? Cammy's, the way she's described, just very like cold and calculated. And then as everybody's like, we have to get out of here because they start noticing the drawn world, the non-existent Nevada desert is creeping in on their world. Things are changing more and more quickly. They're hearing coyote howls that the sun are is almost quite set now. accurate. Yeah. Oh, no, the moon is up. Yeah. Mr. Cowpoke moon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's been like 10 minutes since the book started. So yeah. it's only 445 <laughs> or something. And Cammy is like, you're not going to leave my son's body here. You have to take it. Nobody is in shape to drag a dead body anywhere. And it was when Johnny was like, what about Kali? Like, he doesn't have a mom here to protect him, to like make people take his body. Because I'm sorry, you guys die. I'm not going to put myself out, like exert myself when I'm trying to survive. We definitely discussed this in an earlier episode, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, with the redhead. Mm-hmm. I just want to reiterate, Leave I'm you leaving guys. you. Save You're me dead. at no matter you don't what care. cost. I'm not listening to Josh. <laughs> <laughs> it was just really frustrating to me, like that whole, like I get it, mm-hmm. it's your son, but bitch, take your living kid and worry about him and get out of here and let these people do what they need to do. I think that seeing what she saw is where from that point on, Cammy isn't any form of the Cammy we've met. I think th- her mind has snapped. At that point. Yeah. Which is also why it's so easy for Tack to take the drive. Well. Tack and Seth. Yeah. (laughs) Does Tack take the uh, We'll get to it. Yeah. But first, Audrey arrives at Tom's house to find whoever is still there. It's just Tom. Tom, (laughs) Yeah. Well. That's right. Gary's there. Oh, yeah. He's not dead yet, but he's the creature is going to come kill him. He's been to be. They decide to leave Gary passed out and plan to head over to the Carvers so everyone can be together. Everyone starts to meet up again. Cynthia saves everyone from some coyotes with the human fingers. (laughs) Susie realizes that Jim is dead and starts freaking out. And everybody's just so on edge that they don't have any sympathy for her. And her mom is screaming too, Kim. And somebody tells her to shut up, and she does. But Susie continues screaming, and and somebody asks, I think somebody asks Belinda to help, and she slaps Susie, yeah, she which does. starts this beef between Kim and Belinda, where she calls her um, derogatory racist things, and Johnny yeah, later on in the kitchen, nowhere. yeah, almost is going to put his fist through her face and I am for it. But then everybody's yeah. like, oh, don't, Johnny. <laughs> it's like, the one time I want you to hit a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I don't mean it. Before the end of the chapter, though, we get a little more Seth Tack conversation. Mm-hmm. And I love that here it talks about that Seth has the power, but Tack has been thinking about this for however long it's been trapped in that little mm-hmm. hole it has been anxiously waiting so it is we're getting that hint of uh classic bachman evil overconfidence in the villains yeah when it's revealed what everybody's been seeing the street being turned into all this like hodgepodge of stuff they can't quite understand from tack's perspective we find out that tack is designing this to look like desperation the year that it escaped mm-hmm. briefly uh, from the China pit. That's what he knows. Yeah, I just love that it, it happens. It was an 18, 1858 you know, for really wanting to get out of there, he sure does miss home. Yeah, he's a little homesick. <laughs> Speaking of desperation, the chapter ends with a sealed letter by Alan Symes to be opened after his death. We finally learn what happened the day that the Garens came to desperation. This is such an interesting sequence of events. The first thing I got out of it after finishing the letter is, God, that postcard makes sense. Yeah. The excitement of that postcard. Oh, it's so heartbreaking. It's, oh man, it's brutal. the, The most impactful part for me was... Was the recognition, we mentioned this earlier, of the relationship between Seth and his dad. 
Because mm-hmm. what I mean, we don't have to like spend a lot of time on it, but essentially what happens is Seth speaks up, so they actually do stop at the office, and Seth is like full steam ahead, just running in, pointing at the map, asking to see, asking to see the old mine, and Alan's explaining like everybody, his family was acting really weird, and I came to understand why later because the kid was just being normal, but yeah. he didn't know that he doesn't usually verbalize like that, and so just it just takes us through from this guy's perspective, like meeting this family. This kid is so excited. They're explaining like, hey, you know, this is like a breakthrough for him. Can you please show us this mine? We, we don't know why it's so important, but like he's never been like this. Please help us. And it just, you know, it, it gets to the guy, it gets to Alan and he's like, okay, yeah, let's, let's do it. So he takes them all in, into this area and Seth ends up going off, like getting away from everybody and going off on his own. And so Alan and Seth's dad, whose name I cannot remember. Bill. Bill, maybe. Yeah. They go after him. And it's a really cool sequence where like they hear, it sounds like there might be a cave in, like they hear stuff happening and it's terrible. And they're going like further and further and deeper in and they find Seth's boot. And eventually they find Seth and Alan is watching as his dad's like, you know, terrified, but relieved to have found him. And with the most like love and tenderness in the world, puts his cowboy boot back on his foot. And that's the thing that haunts Alan. Like even when Audrey wrote him the letter and he lied to her, he has felt so guilty about this and has thought about reaching out to her and telling her the truth. Like we went in there and when, when he found Seth and he hugged him, nobody saw this but me, but there was this grin on that kid's face that felt like something was wrong. This one thing that you left out. Oh no, two things. I left out just, a lot, Ben. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> but the one thing is that as he's following Seth down, he hears Seth singing mm-hmm. the Bonanza mm-hmm. theme. And then at some point as he's down there, he transitions into a song he doesn't recognize, but he later finds out is the Motocops theme. But for a second, he swore he heard two voices yeah. singing the songs together, yeah. which is so cool. We find out later that's Tack luring Seth mm-hmm. in. And the other thing is that the first thing that he finds in the mouth of the cave before finding Seth's boot is the Cassie Styles Mm, action figure. I forgot about that. That he looks down and just sees this action figure that he says, oh, it must have fallen out of the kid's pocket. Hmm. We know he didn't own those toys. Oh my God, I forgot he didn't own those toys. (laughs) It's a totem. Yeah, it's it's a... Tack somehow Instead of a wood, yeah. Yeah, instead of the stone totems... It tax somehow used his. It's a can toy. That's can toy. Yeah. yeah, awesome. That's probably what all of those toys are. He came back with all the can tops. Yeah, yeah. It's or took one and then created. The yeah, others. or whatever. Yeah. Uh, it, it's so just that's a really like a cool badass connection to that other. Story. And the fact that Seth didn't grab it, this guy grabbed it for him and gave it to him. And later. now he's dead. <laughs> well, no, seriously, Wait, we're he? reading this letter because he died. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's it's true. O- he died, and then it says "open on my death." Yeah. Oh, the- see, I I assumed this was just the book being like, no, nope. no one has ever it's read a- this. No, but- it says he died at the top oh, of that. Okay, yeah. I missed that. Anyway, the next chapter starts with our groups finally coming together and trying to get Jim's body over the fence. This is where Kim Geller is racist. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Which can I? throw out there because kim has not shown any sort of reaction like this ahead of time could it be the tech influence the same way that he dialed up jim where like he took her bad intentions and raised them to 11 That's it what could made be her. we don't get it's very that possible insight, but i don't see why kind not. of a the outsider and yes. the guy from mm-hmm. the outsider mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yes i know exactly what you meant <laughs> They scuttle over the fence. They get attacked by creatures, like, just as they climb over the fence in the nick of time, which is really cool. And when he lands on the other side of the fence, he looks up and sees the sky. 
And this is maybe the scariest part of the what this reminds me of, and it's the other way around because the book I it reminds me of was written years after this by Bachman's son. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. Oh boy. Joe. Wow. Joe Bill. Joe. <laughs> Please don't quit the podcast, you guys. It's uh, his son, Ho Jill. Oh, yeah, there it is. Ho Jill. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> Spoonerisms, everyone. It reminds me of Christmas Town in Nosferatu. Oh, yeah. Oh. Hell yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Which we have not covered in the maybe one day we will cover Nosferatu. It's a crazy book, too. Mm-hmm. But the, the sky is filled with stars that are too big. And blinking on and off like Christmas lights. That is the most upsetting description of this world that is creeping in on theirs to me, too. It's uh, Is this where Cynthia gets to call somebody a cunt? Maybe. Dur- during this whole, like, Did Cynthia fight. ever get to call somebody yes, a cunt? Yes, she does. I missed this. it! She does. And I was like, yeah, I was so happy for her. But it prompted me to think of something I wanted to ask you guys. Mm-hmm. Can you think of another Bachman King character who has been written into more than one book and like survived the way Cynthia has, but doesn't have their own book. Like we have Holly, who's mm-hmm. an amazing character I mean, who's shown up in multiple things. Yeah. She has her now own she story. Has her own book. Yeah. But I was just think I was thinking of this the other day. That's an interesting I was listening to this as I was getting ready for work and she was like, Oh, you can't. I'm like, hell yeah, Cynthia. She got it in. <laughs> Cause we didn't get that in the desperation adaptation. So that's like my thing now. And I was like, you know, I would love a Cynthia book. Like, why don't we have a book about Cynthia? She survived all this I stuff. I would love that so much where the book is Cynthia's life from the end of desperation to now. And we find out the her entire life in that span, entire Richard Bachman books happened to her. Like, oh my god we find out that like every five years something catastrophically oh awful happens well, I don't want to, that her. to happen to her and ben. now she's no. like uh she's like terminator sarah connor sarah connor now she's like a badass sarah <laughs> yeah. connor who travels across the country getting Saving into the world supernatural scrapes poker face uh yeah poker <laughs> face but with monsters yeah god i would love that show <laughs> oh, I'm played by Natasha I, Leone. Yeah. <laughs> yes, please. On, I just figured out how to save the uh, Firestarter remake. You have Cynthia Shope at the end and tell Charlie she's putting together a team. Yeah. <laughs> she's the Sam Jackson of, yeah. <laughs> of the shop. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, a Gila monster tears uh, Gary's throat out and it is not important and not mentioned again. Yep. It's, yeah, that's it. You it did just it. happens. And you're like, oh, okay. I wonder if that big monster lizard is going to come back. We could back. have never no. returned to Gary and I wouldn't have known. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Inside the Carvers, Johnny flips out on Kim and is like, hey, don't be racist, you piece of shit. And she says, no, and we hate her. Mm-hmm. Uh, her daughter disowns her, which is pretty great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I like, this is where Audrey starts to tell her story, like what's going on with Seth, right? As mm-hmm. much as she can share. I also yeah. love that she knows she has to hold so many things back because she doesn't know who Tech can read. Well, and two, considering what they've been through, I thought her motivation was if I tell them too many things that scare them, they're not going to help me. They're going to kill Seth. They're going to oh, turn yeah. on him, which they, I think she, she knows she, they would have. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's Cammy's first suggestion out of the gate was. Yeah. Which, you know, she knows how it feels to lose a son. So mm. again, it, that madness, that's why I mm-hmm. feel like it's, she is in full free fall. Mm-hmm. Uh, and just then the power wagons are back. So Steve and Cynthia, Cover Ellie and Ralph, jump, uh, who I forgot were in this book. Yeah. They have been asleep yes. in a room somewhere in the Carver house. You know what? They're like in a pantry. Time. That's fine. <laughs> yeah. Ellie, we find out Ellie took Ralphie into a pantry so they could be quiet and alone. And I think Steve and Cynthia don't even talk about it. They just, he, like, it starts to go down and they just bolt for, yep, mm-hmm. to they're protect cover them. the kids. They make a good team. They do. And uh, everyone is on the floor when we reach the end of the chapter. Another entry in Audrey's diary. It just 
talks about the tax weird sexual obsession with her and Cassie Styles. Yeah, because she's it. telling the group Tack wanted to experience sex with her and Herb wouldn't let mm-hmm. it happen. And and so they figure out, I think it's Johnny who's like, or maybe it's Tom who's like, he didn't commit suicide, did he? And she's like, no. And that's also her, kind of her evidence when they talk about uh, can Tack jump into other people? And she's like, no. <laughs> yeah, because she asks Johnny to help her with something. And we, we don't know what all of this <laughs> is yet or what they're supposed to do or what she and Seth have done. And that's his concern. Like, well, can he jump into one of us? And she's like, no, 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 he can't. Because he would have done that and fucked me. (laughs) Audrey mentions that, hey, everyone, we don't have to be rash. There is hope. I've done something. something. (laughs) Did anybody have any guesses? You you said you uh, had figured it out. I didn't, but I... At what point? I was the asshole who was like... God, you idiot, just make him have diarrhea. Give him food poisoning. And so I was really frustrated. I'm like, I wonder what stupid plan she came up with. <laughs> and it's to give him food poisoning. <laughs> so yeah, did you guys have I, any idea? Not a single clue. Until I, she started going through the, when it started happening. Yeah. I was like, holy shit, that's smart. Mm-hmm. I, I've remembered that this, that doesn't leave your head. Oh yeah, like, yeah, for sure. When, uh, well, the, before, the first time, if you can recall. Before this podcast, when I would talk about this book like the thing i would hmm. lead off with like the main the the final like one of the main plot points is a child who's been possessed by a demon gets fed laxatives and that's like how they win and that's <laughs> crazy that's a crazy sentence yeah. how do you not want to read that book <laughs> it's a major spoiler but i was you, gonna say yeah. you're just really ruining a huge plot point for everybody <laughs> Of all the deaths, though, this next one I think <laughs> is my favorite. Yeah. And it's so the power wagons have uh, lined up down the street. Their shotguns are now basically rocket launchers and they've <laughs> blown the, the street to shit. And they're all parked outside the Carver's house. And Kim Geller goes to talk to the manager about it <laughs> and just storms out. And she's like, You look here. You get off my block. <laughs> They vaporize her. It is the (laughs) most cartoony thing that happens to a character, I think, Mm -hmm. where she is literally there one second and then a cloud of red mist (laughs) the next second. And and her shoes are still there with her feet still inside. (laughs) The only thing more cartoony that could have happened is... They all shot at her, the dust cleared, and she had a duck bill on the back of her head. <laughs> she had to turn around. <laughs> Despicable. Um, and also, we mentioned that I, or maybe we talked about beforehand, I mentioned that I could not keep Kim and Cammie mm-hmm. straight. In my head. <laughs> I had a hard time, too. So when this happened, I was like, oh, She's dead. And then Cammy kept doing stuff. And I was like, she got blown up. What is happening? Why why did she get oh yeah, there In were two defense, different people. Like we didn't get any time with them. They've yeah. we've seen them through the eyes of other characters, really. True. Um Hasn't Kim been hung over this whole time too. For her sake, I hope. When so. they when they woke oh, her up yeah, on the couch, like, a- wasn't she hung over? <laughs> <I think so. laughs> Oh, I didn't mention that this chapter started with something that we had guessed in episode one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Maybe episode two. We've been getting Poplar Street. This date, this time. Mm -hmm. And this chapter is the first chapter that starts with desperation. Uh, What what is it? Desperation slash regulators time. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that changes because now we get... Uh, Seth's place, Seth time, or something. I'm glad we got to see his lair yeah. that she wonders that because she knows her laughing place, so she hopes Seth has a place to go to. And now we see it. It's uh, just tunnels. <laughs> it's just tunnels and a big crazy door that he has to wait to open. Uh, he does use the phone and he calls the Carver house. And as soon as it starts ringing, Audrey's like, it's for me. <laughs> Which is hilarious. The telephone is on the floor, the handset far away off the hook, mm-hmm. and the cord has been blown from the wall. Which is like, <laughs> yeah, I got this. She listens to Seth, and Seth tells her it's go time. So she grabs Johnny, and they head across the street. 
and that's it's we, for the big reveal. Yeah, that's when we get the reveal mm-hmm. that the plan has been she she put X lax in his chocolate milk, the, his the the only thing Tack will drink. Yeah, because uh, one time we were told <laughs> that he likes chocolate milk, and another time we were told that the, Tack don't... doesn't like to be in his body when that's happening. And mm-hmm. one time he had food poisoning and he had to stay out of his body for a while, but he checked back in. I also set this up poorly. Because I talked about the Hobart thing, mm-hmm. and there's a real big emphasis on on tax reach. Because she's trying mm. to figure out is Seth leaving the house to do this? Like, how close does he have to be to have power over something? So that's kind of how we're getting to understand they they if they can get Seth away from Tack while he's out of his body, they might have a chance. Yeah, which is a great plan. Yeah. yeah. It's also so crazy because they said so many times about Tack leaving his body, and I didn't piece together that it meant literally yeah, until it's this kind point of, where it describes the, the like lights? when the, when they do see it. Yeah. I didn't I, I was I, so thrown off that it was literal. I did not care for this. Same. It's the fact that the Audrey's diaries spent so much time being like mm, I had I couldn't I spent, spent so long trying to figure out when he was Tack and when he was Seth. And then now she's like, oh, yeah, I see it leave his eyes, like, literally. And I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> Stop making things up. <laughs> uh, but no, it, as they come across the street, he's just floating in a corner. What, meanwhile, across the street, Belinda notices that Cammy and one of the rifles are missing. And basically everyone was like, hope that doesn't turn out bad. <laughs> Yeah, they really don't do anything, do they? What can they do, though? I know. Well, go look. For, I don't know. Yeah. We get a Fuck little bit. off if you think I'm leaving that house <laughs> yeah, one I'm, more time for I'll anyone. I'll abandon a dead body. <laughs> <laughs> Tack in Tack Town is floating around and thinking about how much he hates pooping. And he thinks, well, it doesn't matter how well Seth has been holding up against me so far. He's still just a child, and he doesn't know that I can be in his body while he poops. I just don't (laughs) want to. I I mean, the way you describe it makes it sound outrageous just now, but that's literally (laughs) what he's thinking. Yup. Oh, and he is this where he knows where Seth is hiding and he's like Seth doesn't know I know like I can still sense him I it's just like his pr- presence mm-hmm. that he senses mm-hmm. this is when Johnny and Audrey arrive inside the house and Johnny thinks about we're bad neighbors we, we are terrible this. neighbors that we let this get this bad yeah uh, again yeah all good points mm-hmm. Cammy being guided by Tack right right well it says several like more than once I think with her as things progress that she would have done this anyway. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's so it's, true. It's Cammy and Tack. Yeah. She's she's a willing passenger, seems like. Oh, well, is it well, Cammy and Tack? Cammy and Tack. It's Cammy, Tack, and Seth. <laughs> yeah, I, I want to know I, yes, at what ta- point. I, would say. I think it's both. I think Tack put some influence in there to do something. Mm. And I think Seth shaped what happened. Uh, the whole time, Seth is playing like 4D chess. Yeah. yeah mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, let's talk about step ahead. this fire starter moment. This pulling the levers in Charlie's mm-hmm. head. Did you guys think of yeah, that? Yeah, that was really great. So because it's Seth's place and he can manifest whatever he wants, he manifests a control panel with all these levers and he puts them all down and it he holds them down because those are the access for Tack to get back in. Mm-hmm. And, and Tack hasn't gotten fully into mm-hmm. him before. Like, he can't access all of Seth's power, we right. find out here, too. Which is part mm-hmm. of why he needs to kill all the people so on the street. So he can be powerful enough to get in break there. break through whatever yeah. this last defense is. So he fights Seth uh, holding the levers down, just as Johnny sees Cammy across the street with the rifle pointing directly at uh, Audrey and Seth. Before anyone can act, Cammy fires a shot through Seth's temple and a second shot into Audrey's well, throat. Well, the one through the temple goes into her chest. It goes, it goes into, into both of them, yeah. It's, how do y'all feel about this? This is the really point that sad. I'm like, oh, this is a Bachman book. I was. So this was I, the point that I was like... I was surprised that they both died. I And yeah. I should have known because it's a Bachman book, but... I really didn't expect it. I did not think it was. I thought, yeah. I don't know what I thought, but I was 
shocked. <laughs> yeah, having the happy ending being uh, our two characters who have been living through hell uh, get the sweet release of death. Pretty fucking grim. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but also at the same time, you're like, also kind of good. Thank God <laughs> you can rest. It It's described in such a way that like, obviously people can survive things in life can be worth living beyond a bad event, even if that event is horrible and has gone on far too long. Like, I want to say like, oh, it's worth, you know, continuing to live. I don't want to give that message. But the way it's written, you feel relief for them. Because what's next? How what mm-hmm. what's next for anybody on this block? Uh, when it shows, uh, says that Audrey's smiling, still holding him, really got me. Can we okay? Can we talk about this Seth Tack debate we've been dancing around? Because it's it, this comes from Johnny, right? Mm-hmm. Because Johnny hears, or like, is it in his head as it's passing by? Oh yeah, so. Um, <laughs> Tack has been trying to Get squeeze Seth. its way back inside Seth, and that's what, like, the two of the levers are his eyelids, for instance, and mm-hmm. he's keeping them closed. And as Johnny kind of goes through, passes through Tack a little bit, or... It, it's like these these red lights and dots yeah. around them, so there's, it's like this, it's not a smoke like in Desperation, mm-hmm. but so that's something kind of tangible that he can interact yeah, with. Yeah, and he's mm-hmm. getting... I don't remember exactly what message he gets. It's well, he it's a couple of things because he's told he hears someone tell Cammy to do it mm-hmm. and to do it now and yes. tell Audrey get ready. Like it's he basically hears Seth saying, "Shoot us, and Aunt Audrey, brace yourself. Like yeah. this mm-hmm. is it. Mm-hmm. We're all we're gonna die." Right? Do we actually hear that he hears it, or is it just at the start of the final chapter? He's like. No, nah, it was totally Seth's idea. No, we we get the dialogue okay. of them. Yeah, I missed. That. I didn't listen to the audiobook, so I don't know if he reads it. In it's in confusing their in the audiobook, oh, okay. which is why I missed they it. Do. I had to go okay. back in the book and yeah. get the actual. Yeah, it is in the book. It's two okay. different. It's different instructions yeah. being given. And the way I thoughts. read it was the next, the final chapter starts with Johnny being like, "Don't worry, everyone. Seth wanted this as kind of <laughs> like a." Yes, a ch- an autistic child died, and I have to lie to these people to get them to not. Uh, yeah, it's it's not as clear in the audiobook because I was thrown to, but once you see it in print, it makes more sense. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't translate well to audio. Uh, there's a very sad uh, final entry in Audrey's oh, journal about before, trick or treating. Before we get, before we move to the next chapter, we skipped over Cammy's fate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Gore. Her fate is gore. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Tack hulks out of Cammy. Yeah, it rules. Yeah, he tried. Well, this is kind of like what we get in Desperation. He can't be contained by anyone except someone apparently with powers. Extraordinary. Yeah, and Cammy doesn't have that, so he basically like gets in her and immediately bursts out. She she's so weak. (laughs) (laughs) Before she explodes, she looks at them all and says. Uh, this isn't over. I will find you all. I know all of you. I know all of you, Us. and I will find you. We'll talk about that in a minute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, because we go to the final chapter. Time has started to move again. Cops and firefighters are showing up, and they're like, what in the fuck? Who's the ba- <laughs> who did this? Like, they don't know who to point their guns at. Yeah. Steve's They're pointing them like- at Steve, and he's making jokes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. he's a moron. Steve's a stupid. I love he's him, a but he's so dumb. I love him. <laughs> there is a callback to Desperation. With the where cowboy they cloud? All, oh, I love that. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, that they look really up, smart. and there's a rider on the storm riding away uh, that breaks up. And dissipates. Mm -hmm. Uh, Johnny then says, tells the cops to fuck off and goes to play his guitar. And we get a letter between two random women talking about a haunted gazebo (sighs) in uh, Mohonk. This is why I felt, and Josh, you made a very good argument that kind of made me change my mind. I felt like this was a King book because of this happy ending. Because it's, it seems so like, Oh, it'll be okay. Let me make this better. <laughs> There's a little band-aid for you at yes. the end. Yeah. It was a little too happy. I, okay. You- Here's my question. Are they ghosts or are they the final final remnants of Seth creating 
something out of nothing. Because the final thing in the book is a drawing that Seth has done of him and Audrey wearing the clothes that these people saw him in. So did he just like kind of create an echo of himself? I think he created an echo of both of them because someone so okay we should what happens Mm -hmm. is it's a letter between these two women kind of mirroring like the audrey laughing place jan thing it's she this lady's telling her friend about this beautiful wonderful place and hey you're gonna really get a kick out of this because you love like ghost stories and stuff and here's what happened there's been reports of people spotting this child and woman and she goes on to describe them and and mother son mendo meadow is what they call it yeah mm-hmm. and you know they he looks like her and they look happy and um people have found things that they've left like it's a, like a really intriguing cool mm-hmm. ghost story but there's a comment about like maybe they're not ghosts maybe they're people who live on another plane so mm-hmm. we can't interact with each other we just catch glimpses of them sometimes cuz she's explaining that people are trying to like catch them and can't it's just like sightings and that's it mm-hmm. so i think that his power of creating these places for audrey and a place for himself left enough like i don't know so let's call it psychic residue for lack of a better explanation that they are living on in some way you could explain it as on another plane of existence Mm -hmm. where they don't have a physical body or maybe even aren't necessarily who they were or just like living beings of energy. That's kind of how I took it. Hmm. Uh, Well, I have, I have two final thoughts, like a final question, which is one of the things they, it's part of the evidence that they are there and real solid things is they're leaving shit all over Mm -hmm. the place. There are bowls of SpaghettiOs. Just yeah. over the <laughs> they are yeah. It's weird. But one of the things that a per- one of these ladies in the letter finds, I think, is a Cassie Styles action figure. That being That's upsetting the, to me, though. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The that that is the thing that caused tack. Like that was do we think this is lingering tack energy? He said is he'd be a, back. Is this <laughs> another way for tack to enter the world that someone is gonna find this action figure? And become the next vessel. I don't know. I maybe. Interesting. I do have an alternate theory about the Cassie Styles. Now that I've had some time to think about it, okay. since you exploded my mind, I'd love to hear it. What if Seth created the action figure, and that was part of Tech being like, "Oh, this is the one." Like mm. the, already, because he'd already been luring him in with the cause when when we find out Seth was told by Major Pike and Colonel Henry. That he could see the Ponderosa if he looked mm-hmm. through the crack. And like, so we mm-hmm. don't know where that conversation mm-hmm. happened with Seth, how far out he heard it. I wonder if his ability to manifest, Tack mm. essentially gave him uh, a, a, not a breadcrumb he, exactly, but. And did he keep some of that power from Tack living inside of him? And I that's why that's, he and Audrey exist with quotes around it? I think Seth has that power. Okay. Mm-hmm. I would buy that too. I think Seth, I think the manifesting power is is mm-hmm. all Seth's shine. And Interesting. my final final thought, also to do with this action figure, these women writing the the letter, when they pick it up, they're like, "Oh, it's an action figure from it looks like a cartoon or something." But I don't recognize it. And when I showed it to my grandchildren, they didn't yeah. either. Mm-hmm. The moto cops don't exist yep. in whatever plane of reality. So I this is in. So that <laughs> would make me think that this is a different plane and they are witnessing like echoes of them. And also that ties in to tax final words. I we've been saying, you know, the connections between these books mm-hmm. aren't really a connection. The the books aren't about They're not supposed to both have happened. Yeah, they're not one to one. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But it reminds me of the end of the book. John dies at the end. Yes. Sorry. I love yes, that book. I have a signed such copy. It's a good book. I just oh, watched the movie I'm, the other day. <laughs> Jason Par- Pergen? Pargan? I love him. Mm-hmm. But in that book, uh, how do I do this without spoiling the entire I don't know book? if you can. <laughs> but the, the, there is an entity who gives this final speech. The, this entity is this ultimate evil that exists throughout the multiverse and he's saying like okay you beat me 
but only in this reality. Mm -hmm. There are infinite realities where I win. And just by the law of averages, I am always going to win. And then the good guys are like, well, then that means there are an infinite number of realities that we win. And also, who the fuck cares? We're in this one. We beat you. <laughs> like, it's awesome. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But that makes me think that Tack, the reasons that the characters were brought together in desperation is not just God or the devil. It is Tack specifically somehow altering the multiverse existing in all realities and somehow drawing these same people to him over and over across infinite worlds. So there are infinite books in this series that just See, haven't been written. I wish you I wish I had said what I thought the doll meant before you said that cuz mine's going to sound so stupid. I, I have to hear it. I thought it looked different because it's Audrey. It looks like Audrey. Like I love that too. All right, now we're going to go to my theory, because uh, it's probably the most complicated of the bunch. Okay. Because, uh, all right, I don't don't believe in time travel, all right? Just in in life or in in books? In in everything. Which, our next book is 11-22-63, so this is a weird time to take that stance. I don't believe in time travel. (laughs) Yeah, me neither, Josh. (laughs) Well... It's not real. I'm glad you're on my side already. Well, time is an ocean, so technically he's right. What? <laughs> <laughs> All right. The point is that I, I want to book is that the point that I want to make is oh, it's just <laughs> d- see, I'm being wise as hell. Okay, never <laughs> mind. Time, time is time is an ocean. Time is uh, it's a rug. Sometimes you Circular pull it out from under threads. your friends when you're like, I don't believe in time travel. <laughs> All right. <laughs> the point is this, uh, Ben, you mentioned the lady showed her the action figure to her grandkids. Uh-huh. They had no idea who it was. The reason for that is this letter is written June 19th, 1986. Well, that's not what right. The- Here's why. Because that is when Audrey and Jan were at Mohonk. That is her laughing place. Seth's uh-huh. unbelievable power behind that steel door was to basically create a universe. <laughs> and so <laughs> Seth and Audrey get to live in this space and in, in in as far as they will ever perceive it, it will always be that same time and place. But because also with the with Bachman the multiverse time 1991 in this book doesn't necessarily match 1991 in this book. So this book's timeline of 1996 had to create a universe that had a 1986 to go to. And now we have this, uh, another echo world where the, he gets, they get to live in eternity in the space between those two worlds. You know what? That makes as much sense as anything. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of the regulators. Jeez. Let's get to can, can I can I give my rating yeah. first? Yeah. It is not a perfect book. There are some things that are insane uh and uh, some things that don't hold up, but I fucking love this book so much. It is uh, top to bottom totally bonkers. Uh, you have to th- Here's the thing though. You do have to go into it blind. So, listeners, <laughs> uh, before you listen to these episodes, go read the book <laughs> uh, and and then and then come and listen and get to this point where I say five out of five blue chambray shirts. It's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to uh, piggyback off of Ben's, but because you can't time travel because it doesn't exist, you're going to have to use your powers to make an alternate dimension where you can go to a timeline where you haven't listened yet. Oh, like in (laughs) Restaurant at the End of the Universe. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. This book is absolutely insane. I love the... I I didn't think the Desperation Regulators combo was going to be as awesome of an experience as it was because I don't hear more people talk about it. I always assumed that if... If I knew these books were this good, (laughs) I would have read them a while ago. It's, I think these are regularly considered some of his weakest books, and Crazy. I can't imagine that. It's 
honestly, it's just so much fun. So if you yeah. want a fun Bachman book, which is a weird sentence to say, <laughs> then it's it's for sure The Regulators. Five out of five blue chambray shirts. You guys are absolutely right. This book is a ton of fun and like reading them together or even just separate because I this is my first time reading The Regulators. It's like desperation. I've always had a place in my heart for. It's always just I've remembered it. It stood out to me. I think The Regulators is going to be similar to that. Yeah, there are some things that I kind of had to wrap my mind around storytelling wise that were difficult, but I don't think anybody is going to be surprised. I'm going to give the rating that I always give Bachman books four out of five blue Mm. chambray shirts. Insane. (laughs) You're an insane person. You always rate these books too low. (laughs) (laughs) That is it for this final episode of Castle Rock AM. Please join us next time. We will be back to Dairy Public Radio and we'll be covering... 112263, a Patreon selection from Jason Klein, and we are reading through part two. I want you guys. To, oh, sorry. <laughs> you didn't do your thing yet. I'm tell you <laughs> Don't keep it I'm in. Sorry, I, just, I want you guys to know how much it really hurts me to give a book. <laughs> As a bit, uh, as a bit, uh, a lower rating than I would have it's, given it. It's so and painful stick you can't it. keep the fiction I up. I have to tell we you, we haven't it. ended the I episode yet, you. but we're throwing it all out. <laughs> end it, end it before it came in. For Benjamin Graham and CM Alexander, I'm Joshua Khan reminding you: people die hard, by and large, and when they went out, they left without much dignity, and probably without realizing they were leaving it all. Hey everyone, CM Alexander here. Thank you for listening to The Regulators Part 3. We hope you enjoyed it. As always, please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Dairy Public Radio or Twitter at Dairy Public. You can email us at dairypublicradio at gmail.com and check out our Patreon and our Etsy store for bonus episodes and merchandise. Just search Dairy Public Radio on both of those platforms. And for more Stephen King and horror discussions, please visit our Discord. The link is in the show notes. And don't forget to check out our friends, Stephen King Lovers SKL on Facebook, where you will find an awesome community of other King fans to talk King with. That is Stephen King Lovers SKL on Facebook. That's all for now, listeners. Goodbye.